Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Uh, today, I am really excited to have on Alexander Hemmen talking about his new novel, The World and All That It Holds. Alexander is the author of several books, including The Lazarus Project, which was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Among other accolades, he has received a genius grant from the MacArthur Foundation, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Penn W.G. Seabolt Award for Fiction, and the John Dos Passos Prize for Literature. He co-wrote the script for the Matrix, Matrix Resurrections, which I think is really cool. And he also teaches at Princeton University. Sasha, uh, which is, is what you go by. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for joining me. Uh, I, I know that we initially, there is some scheduling issues on my part. And I think like back in February, but you were kind enough to, to reschedule with me here today, which I think actually will work to your advantage because in the interim, I have become a host on the New Books Network. Uh, which, which I means waiting for that to happen. Yeah, there you go. Uh, which means our talk will go out to thousands more people than it, it otherwise would have. So that's that that works for advantage. But regardless, thanks so much for for joining me here. Uh, and shout out to all the folks listening on New Books Network. So your new book. Uh, at first, uh, first of all, I really uh, I loved your book. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was it was really wonderful. And Thank at you. first, when I, I picked it up, I thought it was a World War I book, if you want to like put it under that, you know, that category. But it actually, it takes place over a period of, of time spanning from when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated in 1914 through 1949, uh, after World War II ends. So for this book, I guess, first, just what made you want to write this book? Well... I mean, I conceived of it many years ago. I, I uh, signed a contract with my British publisher for some reason for this book on proposal in 2010. So then, you know, now it's 2023, so 13 years later, it's, it's finally done. And so I had no idea how long it took, at least obviously 12 years, probably 15. The trigger thing was I read history books, and there's a lot of war in that. And uh, particularly, and also spy books. There was this fascinating memoir by um, Frederick Bailey, a British spy, called Mission to Tashkent. He was one of the great um, British spies of the first half of the 20th century. And it went to all kinds of adventures. So the brief version is he crossed the mountains from the British Raj to find himself in Tashkent in 1918. He was sent to, to figure out what, what was happening because of the revolution and everything. And by the time he got there, Bolsheviks or some who claimed they were Bolsheviks took control and he was instantly a wanted man. And there was a series of adventures. And then he ran into a guy who was working for the Cheka, right? The Soviet a secret service who was from Sarajevo, Bosnia, who told him effectively, I know who you are. I know that you're a British spy. So let's work together, right? Because this guy... He just wanted to get out of Tashkent and go back home. So he was doing what he had to to get out. And so he formed this alliance with uh, Frederick Bailey and hired him to work for the Cheka, which was looking for him all over the place. And then the guy whose name was Mandic from Sarajevo, he figured out a way. He spread the rumors that Bailey was in Bukhara, which is 150 kilometers down the road from Tashkent, which was at that time controlled by an emir and was not under Bolshevik control. Uh, and he was keeping it tight because he didn't want to be, you know, conquered by the Bolsheviks. And so he was executing spies and whatnot. Anyway, Mandic spread the rumor that Bailey was in Bukhara and that he was trying to talk Emir into attacking the Bolsheviks. And then he volunteered himself and Bailey to go to Bukhara and liquidate Bailey, right? And they got the papers and got out of Tashkent. And the story and went to Bukhara, and from Bukhara they uh, escaped by way of Persia because Persia was controlled by the British at the time. So that I found that story to be extremely fascinating, this, you know, spy in, in the middle of uh, Tashkent, and also a, a Sarajevo and Abazian whose sole agenda, it seemed, political or otherwise, was to get back home. 
And to me, that was extremely appealing. That's what I would do. And so I thought, started thinking about this, and you know, which means that if I had to get the, a guy from Sarajevo to Tashkent, you know, what is the way to get there? And he was there because Tashkent in Central Asia, or Turkestan as a, as a Russian imperial province or the province of Russia Empire, was where they um, uh, had prisoners of war, particularly from you know the Galician front, and so it was full of uh, of you know um, captives. Uh, prisoners of war from the Austro-Hungarian uh, army, mainly in German too, and which means a lot of people from the Balkans, a lot of Bosnians and then um, Croats and Serbs and Hungarians and so on and so on. And so when the war ended or when the revolution started, they just released them, some of them, and they were fending for themselves, looking for a way to make a living and get back home. And it was not easy, obviously, because it was it was far away. So anyway, I was fascinated by the situation. So that meant that I had to get my characters from Sarajevo to Tashkent, which is by way of World War I. And then I decided to make them go east rather than return, go west, as the original Frederick Bailey and this guy Mandich went uh, in, in his memoir. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, first, uh, a note on, so you mentioned that you read a lot of history books. I read in a, you gave an interview to the New York Times. Um, so I'm also... Hopefully one day we'll be a novelist, but working on a novel. And uh, you, there was a question posed to you, something like, you know, like, what are the, something like, how many novels do you read? Or like, what novels are you reading? And your your answer was like, to be honest, I read a lot of history books. And frankly, that gave me a lot of permission because I read a lot of history books. And I'm always thinking like, oh, you know, like, maybe I should like, I should mix this up and do a little bit more a little bit more novel reading. Your novel is actually the second novel I've had on the show. So this is my 18th episode. So most of the other books uh, I've even interviewed yeah. authors on are history books. But you've, you've just by saying that, you had actually given me a little bit of permission to, to ease into <laughs> by that. By all means, you have my permission. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about your, your main character, Pinto. What, what kind of person is he? And, and what, what is this character's background? Pinto is Sarajevo-born Sephardic, Sephardic Jew. After uh, the Jews were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula, many of them went to the Ottoman Empire, which did not um, persecute them, right? And they could live relatively freely. So Sephardic Jews spread all over the Ottoman Empire, and a few of them eventually ended up in Shanghai. Um, that means from Bosnia, which is the westernmost province of the Ottoman Empire, and then, you know, the Balkans and Greece and Turkey and then Iraq and so on, um, which means that his native language was Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, which the um, um, Sephardic people um, brought along with them. But he also grew up in Sarajevo, where there was a, you know, the local language spoken, Bosnian and Serbian and Croat. Now, the, the, days, uh, the names are a little complicated, but Bosnian. And he also was a student in Vienna. So because Bosnia became under Austro-Hungarian control in 1878 after um, the Ottoman Empire was defeated in um, the war, and then somehow the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire benefited from that after the Berlin Congress. Bismarck orchestrated all that. Anyway, they occupied Bosnia, and they were there for about 40 years until the end of the war, World War One, And... They, uh, in 1908, they annexed Bosnia, which meant that when it became a territory, he had, you know, access to Vienna and studying Vienna. So he's multilingual. He's a, he's a homosexual. Gay as an identity was not available at the time, but he um, freely enjoyed the benefits of that, and in Vienna in particular. And he also has poetic proclivities. He writes poetry, was hanging out in cafes in Vienna and having affairs. And so... When the Archduke comes, it seems like it's the beginning of the new century, right? Uh, Bosnia is opening into the West and, you know, all these things are available and, you know, this sort of overlapping of two periods and two empires is still on. And all and, and possibilities, this is in the first chapter, possibilities are imaginable to him. And, of course, it all blows up after the Archduke is killed. Uh, and then, you know, a large number of Bosnians and many other subjects of the emperor were um, uh, mobilized to go and fight in the war, as was Pinto, because he was in Vienna studying pharmacy, so he ends up being a, 
a sanitat soldat, right? Uh, like a, a medic, right? And then ends up being a surgeon, cutting off limbs and so on. And so uh, the Bosnian units, they fought first in Serbia and then they were sent, uh, Bosnian and, uh, yeah, Bosnian units in Galicia, right? In, so they were there in 1916 where the so called Brusilov offensive took place, where the Russians broke the front and rushed through and it was, you know, they destroyed effectively the Western Front from the Austro Hungarian and German um, uh, military or forces. And I think about a million people died in, in that battle. And this, of course, resulted in a large number of prisoners of war. And then Pinto is shipped to Tashkent. Uh, in, after the first chapter in the army, he meets a man, Osman, a, a Bosnian of Muslim background, a Muslim, and they fall in love. And then they're lovers on, for as long as they can be. Yeah. And, you know, I thought it was so interesting. So the this story, as you mentioned, it, it starts in 1914 with the assassination of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And me, so I was uh, educated in American schools and, and um, World War One. when I'm, I'm learning about it in school, and still I think to most Americans and many in the West to this day, the only time Sarajevo gets brought up is, or really kind of Bosnia or that part of the world, is when Franz Ferdinand gets assassinated. That's all. I don't. I don't know anything in in Sarajevo that happens uh, after that, or I didn't. But just like you were saying, with how your characters kind of go east, like your your story isn't the normal pivot. Is okay, Archduke Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. Now let's talk about France and Germany and Britain. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What was going on in, in Sarajevo in, in Bosnia at this time? Well, I mean, there was no um, fighting around there because it was deep into the territory of, the, relatively speaking, the Austrian Empire, because Serbia orchestrated the assassination and was accused by the Austrian Empire. They issued an ultimatum, you know, for them to deliver the conspirators and, and some of the assassins, in fact, went back to Serbia. And so Serbia refused that. And so uh, the, the first thing that Austria attacked, the first country, was Serbia. So Bosnian forces went to Serbia. And Serbian forces then withdrew south and were, in fact, it, they seemed defeated and were recovering in Greece. And then eventually they went back and liberated the country, which then became part of what is what was then uh, later Yugoslavia. And so... And then after that, the Bosnian forces were sent to the Eastern Front, right, to Galicia and, and Bukovina, a, the Carpathian Front. Uh, too. So in Bosnia, there was, a, there was a military government because it was wartime, but there was no fighting in Bosnia as such um, and kind of folded quickly. So the, so the Bosnian experienced war only as effectively as soldiers of the Austrian Empire, and many of them were. So one of my sources was a memoir by an officer in the Bosnian um, unit that went to Serbia and then to Galicia and eventually fought in Italy, right, at, at the Sochi. Uh, what was the name of the river? The Northern Italy, Italian Front, right? And so, so they all the Bosnians fought for throughout the war for the Austrian Empire until the very defeat. So I'm honestly I'm a little ashamed to say what is the distance between. Where is Galicia in relation to Sarajevo? Well, Galicia is what is now Western Ukraine. Okay. So Lviv would be the biggest town in Galicia. So when after Galicia and Bukovina were the easternmost provinces of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? On the other side of the border was Russia or the Russian Empire. And so, and there was a, it was a, and also Poland, which was absorbed. So Galicia is now you know, Western Ukraine bordering with, with Poland, and um, Bukovina is South uh, West Ukraine bordering with um, Slovakia and also Southern Poland. And so it, it was it was a track, but also it's not you know it's not as far as Shanghai. Sure, yeah. And so like the the next um, chapter of your book, we meet Pinto in uh, in Galicia, like you mentioned in 1916. And then we're also introduced to his uh, his lover. You mentioned Osman. Um, would you say Osman or Osman? How would you? Osman. Osman. What kind of person, what kind of character is Osman? 
talk a little bit about him. Osman is an orphan and grew up in the in the Charsia, which is kind of the downtown of Sarajevo at that time, or any Ottoman uh, built city where people meet to trade and you know do business. They live in their different, um, maybe ethnically organized neighborhoods, but this is where they have stores and this is where they do business. And so he kind of, he was ra raised by the Charsia. In Turkish, the, the word is Charsi and Bosnian for whatever reason, it's Charsia. But, you know, so there's an, a Charsi in Istanbul, the big market. And so he knew everyone. He's full of stories. He's very charming. He can talk to people. He was selling this and that when he was and filling up pipes with opium or afium in Sarajevo back in the day. So sort of, um, you know, hustling t to survive. And so when he is in the army, he's, he's just a soldier, right? He's an attendant to an officer because he's so capable of such things. So, and he, what's the phrase? He thinks on his feet, let's say, while Pinto is reflective or contemplative, right? Sort of thinking about God and poetry and family and what's lost, what's not. Osman is, uh, Pinto uses a, a Sephardic um, idiom to describe it, a, a skill in every finger. Un, en, encadado un marafet. And so this is the kind of person that Osman is. He figures out solutions for things and until he doesn't. Just a, just a note on that. I was going to ask this later, but since you've, uh, I guess, kind of uh, maybe just alluded to it, if you can say that language is plays such a big role in your story. Often, you know, sentences will be in either German or Bosnian or, or some other language, and sometimes they're not translated. What what role did, did language play in this story for you? Well, I always wanted to Pinto to be fundamentally multilingual. That is to have a, a mind, a consciousness that is multilingually organized so that for him everything has several possible words for it and also I, i'm you know multilingual or bilingual at least and and know a lot of people who are and you know that such a consciousness and studies have shown as they say that such a such a mind operates slightly differently the children who grew up bilingual um are, are quicker to think about or think faster about certain things because they test possibilities their minds are trained like that so I wanted Pinto to be absorbed, to have absorbed all that, sort of, all of his dimensions, right, are present in language. He's a Sephardic, right? He studied in Vienna. He's Bosnian. And then as he passes along, he collects languages, right? Because another thing that is taken to be the case, and I think it is the case, is that people, if they speak more than one language, they much faster acquire more languages, right? My daughter is 15. She started speaking French when she was three. She picks up languages like this, like speaks two or three. And well, I, I read that, and this is incredible to me, that you didn't, you didn't learn English until your 20s. Is that, is that right? And not quite. I, didn't, I could speak and get by because I went and I had class in school and also movies were not dubbed and I was into music. <laughs> what I... Was, but the sort of uh, language of conversation and communication, it's a different register, a different level from language in which one would want to write fiction. Yeah. So it, it, that was what I didn't have, that, that language. And so, you know, when you talk and you can't think of a word, you use your hands, you say, you know, can you ask your interlocutor to help you with it? What is that thing, you know? Yeah. And so it's a different mode of communication, but in writing, you can't do that. Well, I can't do that. I don't know. Maybe other people could. So I, what I needed to do is enable myself to write in English. And that um, is much harder, I would say, than simply acquiring enough speaking language. I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed by that. So in college, I learned Arabic, but I could never write a novel in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Arabs who cannot write a novel. In <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I read that and I was like, oh, that holy cow. Um, so, you know, maybe is it is it a love for languages that you would say that you that you have? 
It is. I think, I mean, it is my belief that, you know, the matter of literature is language. And so mm-hmm. it's like, you know, a matter of movie is, is images, a matter of music is sounds, but what I work with is language. And so the more language I have, single language, the better it is. And the more languages, then it's even better. And so I wanted Pinto to operate in that, that multilingual space. There's a notion in linguistics of, of macaronic language from the word macaroni, the Italian pasta, because you can hold it in the hand like separate, you know, pieces of separate macaron. And so macaronic language is commonly used among immigrants, for instance, who uh, might use words from several languages in the same sentence or the same discourse, because it's easier that way. You can't look for the word for, you know, the screwdriver, you know, in English. And so use a local, your, your native word and it is my contention that most of the languages other than those geographically isolated were at some point or another macaronic english was you know anglo-saxon and then the normans came in the 12th century and then it was macaronic for a while they were mixing languages now that's english and now people complain if i use a foreign word like i want that's a cool de sac that kind of approach right and so I, whereas everyone is commonly using french or latin at, or any number of words from different languages. And so I wanted to have Pinto, the kind of initial stage of macaronic mind, right? We all have a macaronic mind to some extent, at least to the extent that we can use different registers within the same language, not only different words that might have different origins, right? But you one speaks one way in, in, a, in an interview, another way with their children, right? Or lovers, right? And so, or students or friends, and so I'm unlikely to curse in this interview unless <laughs> I get really wound up. But you sure. know, once I turn off, I'll start cursing at things in my office. And uh, so I like yeah. that. That kind of language is perpetually transforming and changing and dynamic. And I don't think it's a set frozen thing. And I think and believe that writers change the language. That is, I don't want to want just accept the language as is now and I want to do things with it that have not been done before. So I think they might have been done, but you know. Yeah. And that's so, that's very interesting to me. One, so my undergraduate degree was in linguistics. Uh, So language is so fascinating to me personally. And thinking about what you were just talking about with English, because English is really just a mixture of, of French and German. Well, and then yeah, but also many other languages. I used to teach English as a second language, and you know, people mainly Russian speaking people from the former Soviet Union. And one of the things I would do, I would show them a map from the Encyclopedia of the English Language that showed the countries of the world from which words came to English and with those words. So, you know, and some of them are banal, like sushi, you know, pogrom, right? Chachki whatever, not to mention French or, or German, right? And so because if if a country is, as the United States is, marked by a history of migration, everyone who came brought something in. I mean, everyone who came. And they call it a melting pot, but not everything melted, mind you. And it's no longer a melting pot, which is, I think, a good thing. But everyone brought that into English. There's I remember reading uh, an interview with William Carlos Williams, who spoke Spanish at home, one of the great American poets of the 20th century. And the interview asked him about a particular phrase that he used in in his poem or something. And he said, where did you get that from? And he said, from our Polish mothers, right? Which I took to understand that was really a translation of a Polish idiom or that mothers, you know, were using it in English and so it's poetry in English, but in Pol- in Polish, it was just a mother's in- idiom. And to me, that is entirely fascinating. So I, I never thought that I had to walk into English and just learn the thing as it is. I thought if I'm here, it's going to change. But obviously not just me, not because I'm a writer, but because I, I was an, em- an immigrant, right? So my yeah. uh, ex-wife, she would read my stories early, right, and comment some years ago. And then um, she said once, she read something that I wrote. She said, we don't say this. And I said, well, now we do. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's somewhat arrogant, but it's, in terms <laughs> of writing, this is how I think about writing. I don't oh, care. That's really great. 
Well, and you know, you talk about with your character Pinto. Um, I, I believe there's a, a poem at. He's, I think he's writing a poem at the beginning of the story. He's like, well, you know, actually, let's try that in German and let's let's see how it comes out then. So, you know, I, I love different different appropriatenesses for language at different times and like what that yeah. appropriateness is. Well, let's let's go back to Pinto and Osman and uh, in their relationship. Uh, you know, I would say their relationship is is the heart of the story it is yeah yeah talk so they have a they're lovers they have a, a romantic uh, partnership throughout the story talk about kind of when they're fighting world war one talk about the reactions of the the other soldiers there's there's one line that you that you wrote that you know some of them didn't mind some of them were in romantic relationships themselves and you wrote another line that i i laughed out loud at that some you could be you know you could be affectionate in right in front of their faces they could see it with their own two eyes and they still wouldn't believe two men were in love yeah talk a little bit about the reactions of the other soldiers well i mean it, you know there's a i was in the army as a conscript many many years ago and and it was all men all the time right and so it was a it was a uh textbook homo social organization, right? We were showering naked and we were uh, spending time naked in the trenches when we were cold, we hug each other and, you know, and other in trenches and, and, and the holes in the, in the ground sleeping on some exercise. We would hug each other, right? And so it was so easy to imagine to, to me and then, I'm sort of moderately heterosexual, but imagine that they could slip into desire, right? But it also meant that it had to be strictly governed right in other words if if two men were of call having sex they would get in trouble um, because not only because of general homophobia and patriarchy but also because it would presumably uh, you know weaken the thread of uh, the bond between soldiers if they started having sex with each other right and so in that sense it is in, in a patriarchal homophobic society and most of them were like that for decades you know that such a thing is or men loving each other or ha having sex is kind of unimaginable. But even within the organization of the army, it is even more so, right? But of course, people live their lives and they cannot be governed to the, their desires cannot be governed regardless of the, of the suppression, right? And so they would find a way, right? And, and they would find a way uh, whether they could you know, in the proximity of soldiers who had kind of solidarity with them, had their own desires or didn't care, whatever. Or it was so unimaginable because they were peasants from the mountains who had never thought of that as kind of a, you know, a, a thing to do. <laughs> when I was in the army, I, there were these, it was in, in the infantry. And so it was a wide range of educational and cultural backgrounds. There were people who, you no, know, hadn't really seen a car <laughs> much. Never mind anything else. And to them, and they might have spent time with sheep, mind you, but to them, two men having sex is is fantastic. It's just like it's from how do you do that? There was a guy early on who came and then he refused to serve because he was a drug addict. And then he walked around with half his head shaved when I was in the army. And these, you know, people from the mountains, they would get around him and ask him, So what is it like to take drugs? To them it was totally unimaginable that someone would just take drugs and he would say, it's great, it's great, I recommend it. But So the, the way other soldiers see them, of course, it was, it was an active in Vienna in particular, in the officers and many others, right? They were practicing it as they people have historically from the beginning of humanity, right? But they had to cover it up in, in some ways um, so as to be together. And then eventually kind of when this... What also happens, and it's not a good thing necessarily, that you know, war or displacement, they destroy social, they cannot exist in strong social structures, right? If you, in other words, to enforce homophobia, you have to have a society that enforces homophobia, right? And even if it's in, within the army. But if, if at no, after that first chapter, Pinto and Osman are never in a situation, in a society, if they were, sort of this fluid, war post-war situations right where there are no uh, social cultural forces that are enforcing identities in the way that 
are uh, enforced in, in a relatively stable society by way of education, by way of policing, by way of newspapers, by way of family. They have none of that. They just move through the world. And it kind of, it is a terrible thing that this place, but at the same time, at some point, no one is paying attention to them to enforce their, you know, prohibited um, practices and identity. Yeah. And just kind of like thinking about um, past history books and, you know, memoirs and in um, writings um, about previous wars during previous wars. I remember I was researching a, a U.S. Civil War novel a few years ago, and I was trying to research. I was thinking there must be accounts of um, homosexuality uh, among soldiers. And I remember not being able to find hardly any. Did you were you did you find uh, are there any historical accounts of romantic relationships between soldiers? Well, I mean, well, I mean during World War One, here, and, and, here and there, but they were not romantic stories. But it's impo- because people are, have always been gay, right? And right. Or, not a new concept, right? And so it must have happened. But there are these. Here's one thing: I'll, I, I found it here and there in the prisoners of war camps, Russian prisoners of war camps, right, which were all far far east, right, in Central Asia and even Siberia. There was some where there was particularly where there were officers, these are German and, and Austrian officers, where there was a whole theater scene. So they would stage theater productions like the, you know, light amusing plays from Vienna or, or Berlin, whatever, where men, as in Shakespearean times, would play uh, female roles, right? And some of those men would stay in drag throughout, and they were stars, they were worshipped, Men would ask them, generals would compete for their affection. And so they would be their mistress, right? The general would offer, they would receive, they would receive flowers at the end of the performance. Men, other soldiers would weep at their performance. They, they, they would be living with a general who would claim them in various ways. There was an entire rich theater scene in those prisons of war camps that was entirely organized around cross-dressing and fluid gender identities, right? And that's, this is how people live. They sort of adjust. And so the whole, I mean, we don't have to get into that in sort of the gender theory, but the difference between genders is not binary and simple, right? It, here's where the men stop and women begin. It's a continuity and fluidity. And this is what we are, you know, what fascists attack and hate and what why they prosecute, prosecute trans people and uh, persecute, and, you know, the red states and elsewhere and sort of fascist constructs because it just drives them crazy that they're, it's not just one or the other, men or women. And so that is all all over the books of human history, whatever the, whatever the period, right? Whether it's Shakespeare or, you know, prisoner war camps in Eastern Russian Empire. So I wanted to, so I wanted to ask you um, if you wouldn't mind reading a little bit from, uh, from your book on uh, page 103. And just just starting where it starts with me, Padre, and then going down to Stranger Things Have Happened, uh, about four-fifths of the way down the page, uh, okay. because I want to talk a little bit about this, because it's, it's related to the discussion we're having. Is that okay? Sure, of course. Okay. My Padre Abram used to say that heaven is a revolving wheel, Pinto said. Even if you never move from your place, everything around you will change, and the world and all that it holds will be the same and not the same. We could stay right here and just watch the wheel turn. But if we move, if we keep moving, everything will always be only different, and we will never be the same. There had to have been a world where no one was ever at home, where everyone was always going from one place to another. The Lord must have destroyed such a world and would relish too. For what kind of a place would that have been, a world consisting only of strangers? There would have been no righteous ones there, nothing and nobody older than a day. The people in that world could never be still long enough to see anything. Everything in such a world would have been dimmed by incomprehension. I have no idea what you're talking about, Isaac Abramovich said, his gaze still stuck to the firmament. See what I have to live with? Osman chuckled and kissed Pinto's forehead. Just love each other, whatever the world you think you might be in, Isaac Abramovich said. There's nothing else you can do. And who knows, maybe all this insanity would produce a better world, 
where everyone could love whoever they want. Stranger things have happened. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank um, you. This, this really uh, jumped out at me for lots of reasons. One, obviously the title of your book is in it, um, which always makes me perk up. But that, that last, that second to last line, and who knows, maybe all this insanity will produce a better world where everyone could love whoever they want, uh, really uh, struck me. First, could you just talk a little bit about, about these paragraphs? What, 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 what was your thinking in, in writing these? Well, in this scene, they are sitting in the backyard of Isaac Abramovich. He's a doctor in Tashkent who took them under his wing. It's a kind of a co-conspirator. And his daughter um, will give birth to a girl who would then become effectively Pinto and Osman's daughter. That's by after a series of events. And so they're looking up and then Pinto and his poetic proclivities, he starts, you know, talking about these things, reflecting and espous espousing grand ideas. But Isaac Abramovich has survived, he survived a pogrom in in. Kishinev back in the day, where a, a man who would have been his lover it was killed because you know, Isaac Abramovich is Jewish. And so they, they have this solidarity, the three of them, and, and he knows that they are lovers and he supports that. So he gives them this kind of wise old man thing. I, what's in the book, what I liked, I mean, as an idea, is that, that worlds are, that are constantly destroyed and then they're renewed. And so the book is organized as they pass through various wars, each chapter covers or each part covers a certain war-like situation, right? But they always, some kind of love emerges from all that in, in the end and, and, and stays there. And so as bad as, you know, wars are, something can happen after them. You know, countries, lives, societies have been restored to some extent, not always for the better, but often for the better. And so there's an upside to, you know, um, to a catastrophe <laughs> because there's something, what is beyond the catastrophe? And it's very hard to think about that, to imagine what is beyond the catastrophe, unless there's some kind of anchor of the future in the present. And for them, it's their love. Uh, it is also a reference there's a Bosnian song, traditional uh, Bosnian song, a Bosnian, um, traditional Bosnian music is called Sevdah. And it's very similar in spirit and ideology to, say, Fado, the Portuguese melancholy music. And there's a song that starts, um, a snow fell on the bloom and the fruit. Let everyone love whoever they want. And this is, these are the opening lines. And so this has become... There's a, now that I mentioned the music, a friend of mine who's a, sing, a singer, a young man, but he, he's a, from a dynasty of singers of that music. He recorded an album that has the same name as the book, as directly related to the book. And he recorded some of the songs they sing to each other, including this song. And, and he, one of the things he does in his work sort of uncovers these sort of uh, homoerotic uh, traditions and codes in the traditional Bosnian music, right? And along the lines of what we just talked about, that people always loved each other, right? And those songs, although they were traditionally sang by women, uh, you know, at, at home and so on, in the history of it, they were at some point encoded for the transmission of male love or female love, right? Purely. And so this song, it is an unofficial, that I'm talking about as unofficial, um, anthem as it were of the of the lgbt people in, in bosnia right they know this and so when there's a pride parade they sing the song there and so the, in the song is re referenced in the book so isaac abram sort of catches on to that and so they are it's a moment of solidarity oh that's really that's really incredible well, you know i you know, I, I, I thought a lot about, uh, you know, the destruction of, of two world wars and what you were just talking about with, you know, kind of the Renaissance and, you know, the rebirth that comes after that. And after I read this, I, I kind of just, I had one of those moments where I just, I put the book down and I just kind of like thought a little bit. And I, I wondered if, if in terms of, you know, we're, we're 
obviously at a, a much more open place in terms of homosexuality now than during World War One. And it's almost impossible to kind of to to think what the world would be like without two awful, terrible world wars. And then also too, what you write about later in, in Shanghai and China, the, the terrible things that happened there. I wonder if we would have that same openness if there wasn't so much destruction and insanity and absurdity that was brought, you know, during the first fifty years of of the twentieth century. And I I, don't, I wonder if if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, yes, up to a point. Although we're not, there are many minds, unfortunately, that are not open at all. I mean, there's sort of a count backlash against um, the advancements uh, of, of in terms of um, citizenship and civil rights of the LGBT plus people, right? Is that the violent rhetoric that results in actual violence against trans people in, in uh, large parts of this country? I mean, it's abominable, right? But it is uh, a backlash, right? It is a reaction to um, the changes which are uh, necessary and in I don't think it can be stopped except by violence and societal violence. I mean, they effectively, they, the, the right-wing fascists, they, they're dreaming of genocide. They would like to eliminate all those people, right? Because that's, they will not stop before that. So the, a fight is on in that respect. But I would think the, more, the whole concept of my book is, you know, under what circumstances can love survive? Right. There are many romantic books and novels where, you know, people go on vacation, they fall in love. And it's great. Of course, it's great. They're on vacation. Right. Now, what about the trenches? You know, it doesn't diminish the love from vacation. Love finds ways in various ways. It, it, in any way you get to love, it's fine. Right. But the question is, what can it endure? Right. When does it start breaking down? And as anyone who's ever been married knows that under stress, the relationship of any kind or the rest relationship changes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for worse, sometimes both at, at the same time. So I wanted, so here's a, they're passing through the world that is constantly collapsing and being restored in some way. There's endless violence. There's no society. There are no, there's no infrastructure that would protect them on a basic level. There's no food. Can love survive that? And there's a limit to it, right? There are few love stories from Auschwitz, right? Because it was people, or that we know of at least, because people died. It was difficult. And it destroys, destroying human bodies is also destroying love. And destroying love ends up with uh, attacking love, ends up in destroying human bodies. So I wanted them to put them through the grinder, as it were, see how long, how much can Pinto love in the world like that. And it, in that sense, he's a, he's a hero. There are heroes who, you know, conquer armies or um slay dragons or save lives. And here's Pinto who heroically loves Osman and Rahela through all that. And that to me, that's, you know, that's yeah. as heroic as can be. And uh, another thing that I, I uh, we haven't really talked so much about yet. So Pinto is Jewish and Osman is, is Muslim. Talk about why, why that, those choices to to make those characters of those different religions. Talk about why that was important to you. Well, I mean, it's common in Sarajevo. It, it still is, well, to some extent, even after the war, right? It was a multicultural, multilingual, multi-confessional uh, uh, community, society, right? It resulted in some conflicts and discrimination and segregation. There were different neighborhoods. But historically, as is the case with, you know, the history of gay people, you cannot regulate human love and desire, right? It, 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 except by violence, but even under violence, people find a way. And so the history of Sarajevo, there are all these, you know, what was called, and I detest the word, like, you know, mixed marriages, right? My parents have a mixed marriage, not Muslim and Jewish, but, uh, and so it was common in Sarajevo historically for forever. And so the two of them, also this basic solidarity of being in the trenches together, right? That really with the ethnic differences didn't mean that much to anyone. They were either going to live or die together, right? Um, it was a little more complicated than that in some respects, but there's nothing, we, ha we don't have to get into that. But uh, as for the two of them, they're fundamentally Bosnian in that respect. To them, it's nothing. There's no way in which, there's no life in Sarajevo at that time, around the time or thereafter, where a Jewish man would not encounter daily Muslim 
men or and the other way around, right? And particularly in this common area, the Charshia, the, the city downtown. And so it's not really, you know, overcoming barriers in any spectacular way. I didn't insist on that. It's not like, I don't know, Israel today, right? A settler. It's not like Romeo and Juliet. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think I remember at one point, no, first, I mean, it's this, this, I think goes along with that theme you were talking about that in the trenches in war, you know, just like with two men being in love, these things that, you know, when you see people blown to bits in front of you, it, all of a sudden it doesn't really matter so much anymore that somebody's gay or somebody's a Muslim or somebody's Jewish. But at one point, I think Osman, he, he's, he, without giving away a spoiler here, one of his jobs is working for the, the Cheka and he has to, he has a job trying to find other Muslims. Uh, is that, is that correct for the state security yeah. service? Yeah. Talk about the choice to, to have a Muslim hunting down other Muslims hunting down if you want to use that word yeah i don't know how much work he did in respect <laughs> because he was muslim he sort of worked his way into the czech as an expert on muslims and at that time they were um a, a native rebels who were fighting first russian empire and then the bolsheviks right because they did not want to join the family of nations right in a way that was proposed to them so there there was a there was a guerrilla warfare in central asia where um people of Muslim background, um, Uzbeks and others were fighting Bolsheviks, right? And he was supposed to work his way into, you know, get information and all that. But of course, he, well, his agenda is to go back home. Uh, and so, and, and also he was helping a, a Bailey-like character get out of Tashkent. So the choice was practical, right? As I didn't get into that, but I imagine that he might have sacrificed some had, had to have done some work, right, in that respect to to keep his cover. And there, I mean, there are though, even if Osman and Pinto aren't all the, all the time talking about, you know, what it means that one's a Muslim and one's Jewish. You do write a lot about scenes, uh, or you you write scenes where there are terrible things happening to uh, Jewish people, or there, are, you know, terrible perceptions. Um, there's a Baron at one point, I think who is yeah. in, in German, you're like, he's something like, Oh, you smell Jewish or something like that. Yeah. So I guess going on, looking around Osman and Pinto, what role is, is Judaism and Islam? How is that affecting what's going on outside of, of their relationship in the world? Well, I mean, there wasn't as much Islamophobia uh, at that time as there is now, right? Um, the, the Jewish world conspiracy was always, it was already available. In fact, the Russian, you know, secret service produced the protocols of the elders of Zion at the end of the 19th century and fueled pogroms and the sort of Western European um, or, or generally European anti-Semitism was widely available. After all, Pinto is a descendant of people kicked out of of Spain for being Jewish. And so that is, you know, part of his, unfortunately, tradition in a way that it's not for Osman, right? Today's Osmans have a, a bit of a different story. And so for Osman, and, and he descended, he was his, whoever his parents were, they were subjects of the, of the Sultan, the Ottoman Empire, where Islam was a, the official religion, right? So um, and the Austrian Empire did not go hard on Muslims because it was a, an empire and would try to have um, subjects of all nations, right? Because they were conquering territory. They did not need citizens. So there was no citizens test in the same way, right? So the question is, but today in Europe, it's hard for Muslims to be treated as citizens all over uh, Western Europe. So for Pinto, and, and historically it's accurate, he, he was, he would have been, uh, exposed to anti-Semitism of diff different kinds. And the Baron that you mentioned is also based on historical personality. Baron Unger, Unger and Sternberg, who was a, uh, a German-speaking Estonian who um, was his entire life uh, serving the Russian Empire, right? And ended up um, the real character who operated in Mongolia and with a bunch of Cossacks who, you know, have a history of pogroms in their history. And so I, I moved him south to um, what is now uh, Xi'an, where, you know, so I had to change the name. 
but Ernberg, Unger and Sternberg, he was a he was a fanatical anti-Semite. He has a because of the Bolsheviks who were Jews for him and all this, and he had this fantasy of being a new Genghis Khan who would have a, an alley of gallows from from Mongolia to Moscow, right, adorned with Jews and and communists. This was his. He had visions of this. Well, Sasha, this has been a terrific interview. Thank you so much for uh, for spending some time with me. And everybody, check out The World and All That It Holds by Alexander Heman. Um, go buy a copy. Go check it out from your library. And Sasha, thank you so much.